this happened on James's 20th birthday. I think I'd just gone to sleep about just before 12 and I was woken by a phone call. It was a police officer. He told me that James had been in a fight. He'd been injured. He was in the Royal Melbourne Hospital. And I said, is he all right? And he wouldn't tell me. And he said the hospital thinks she should come straight away. James was unconscious when we got there and had to be rushed to surgery. And we were told it was very touch and go as to whether he would live or not. Every parent has that feeling of dread when the phone goes at the wee small hours of the morning. It's just devastating. It's, you're in total shock and your life is just upside down for many, many, many years. Back in 2008, one of my mates went out with a big bunch of my mates. David Mitchell was his name and uh, they all went out for a, a fun night out. A few of them got involved in a, a bit of a blue sort of escalated from there and uh, there were a couple of bottles thrown, a few punches thrown. David was hit and was unconscious on the ground and then had his head stomped on a number of times. I got the call at about 4am in the morning from uh, one of my best mates. He said that they were all at the hospital. It was almost a, a sort of bedside vigil. He was in a coma for nearly two weeks. But yeah, his life pretty much changed forever that night. You're smiling for the camera, are you? <laughs> James was a really fun kid, full of life and energy, loved to be in the centre of any sort of action, you know, very lively, intelligent, and, you know, just love life, yeah. You made yourself very clear. You know, he has a life now that where he's really determined by so many external factors. Uh, he has ongoing health issues. He's developed severe spasticity and contractures from the brain injury. He has to be fed through a tube in his stomach. When you can't speak and your communication is so limited uh, and you're living in a group home, it, it, it's, it's pretty rough. At the time, I just felt completely helpless. I couldn't do anything about it. I wanted to be there, but at the same time, I was probably lucky that I wasn't. We're just lucky that David recovered fully. He's not able to play footy ever again. He's had to make a few changes to his lifestyle. We're still great mates to this day, and it probably brought a few of us a fair bit closer together, I think. I probably don't get recognised too much myself, but I see some bigger name players that do get recognised all the time and almost harassed, mostly by fans that want to get to know you and have positive messages to pass on, but there's certainly fans, people from opposition clubs that want to stir you up and get stuck into the club, especially when things aren't going the best on the field. see those red flags you've just got to be smarter about the positions that you put yourself in just surround yourself with good people especially when drinking it's sort of everyone's responsibility to stand up and say no to that sort of violence it certainly can affect your career but even more substantially it can affect your life uh, the guy that hit David, I know he spent a few years behind bars and his life changed forever as well um, certainly not for the better David was lucky, but there's been plenty of others that aren't so lucky. It's been extremely devastating. It's, you know, we've, we've been depressed about it, we've been angry about it, we've been upset about it. And we've also felt very compelled to try and do something positive because it was so awful for us that we didn't want it to swamp our lives. We wanted to stand up and try and do something really positive. And that's where the involvement with Step Back Think um, and initiatives in education around violence, young people, 
um, you know, looking out for each other, not getting into those situations that's been so important for us to really help us. This is James's life and we're doing our damnedest to make it as good as possible.